السلام عليكم السلام عليكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم او بريزز اوف الله لورد اوف ذا وورلد اند مي هيز بيس اند بليسنجز بي ابون ذا ماستر ذا هولي بروفيت محمد اند هيز بيو ان كلت اهل البيت اللهم صل على محمد وَتُوبُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا أَيُّهَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ لَأَنَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ Return to Allah in repentance, all of you, O believers, so that you may attain to salvation. And in the same way that Iman has degrees, this shows that the level of salvation that one can attain to also has degrees. In the same way that people can acquire more Iman than others, one can acquire more salvation than others. But whatever your rank of Iman is, the aim of repentance is to acquire salvation. And that's why in chapter 49, verse 11, وَمَنْ لَمْ يَتُوْ فَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الظَّالِمُونَ And whoever doesn't repent, whoever, whatever your castle iman is, whoever you are, from the very minimum iman to isma, to infallibility, Whoever doesn't repent, they will be one of the Dalameen. And this shows that in the same way that Iman and Falah, salvation, have degrees, being a Dalem also has degrees. These terms are very important. One has to appreciate that there are degrees to these terms. If you see the word kafir, if you see the word monafir, if you see the word adhalim, if you see the word mu'min, if you see the word muslim, all of these there are degrees to them, even Islam. In some verses of the Holy Quran, Islam is a very high degree, it's not the basic Islam. These are all very important. One has to understand that all these terms, there are degrees to them. There's the very basic understanding of what is a mu'min, what is a Muslim, what is a Munafir. But there are degrees of Nifaq, de degrees of Kuf. In some traditions, it reads that if one's wife places food on the table and the husband groans for whatever reason. They call the husband a monofer. You see, the traditions, we have that. But it's not the same monofer that in the Sharia they call a monofer. This husband believes in Allah, but he's still called a monofer. It shows even monofer and nefar, there are degrees to it. All these have to be understood like this. Otherwise, one will acquire a deficient understanding of the Holy Quran. Otherwise, if one just limits the to one understanding, and that is a sin, a Sharia sin, when they hear the Imams of the Prophet saying, Dalam to nafsi, they think the Prophet's sin. And they say, what's the problem with the Prophet's sin? There are degrees here, one has to understand. And aflah al mu'minun. The mu'minun have salvation. And then some verses which succeed give examples and degrees of that salvation. Alladina hum anil laqwe mu'ridun. Those who turn away from laqwa, void, futile things. This is on the point with the Hamas we were speaking about. 
last night. In Shomo tonight, I want to discuss, if we have the time, two further classes of people, of Iman, and then what their repentance entails. The tradition from Imam Sadr salam, continues. The repentance of the asfiyo is they repent from being at ease. Tanafos means being at ease. They repent from being at ease. What does that mean? Asfiyo is the plural of Safi, one who is refined, one who is purified from spiritual impurities. It's important to understand how they become purified though, how they become refined from spiritual impurities. Once we understand what it entails for a Safi, purified, refined person. What happens for them to become purified? Once we understand and answer that question, it then follows suit what their repentance entails. Here, these people become purified from impurities and deficiencies as a result of trials and tribulations as a result of burdens. A Safi is one who becomes pure as a result of forbearing these difficulties that he or she encounters. They forbear, they're patient, they undergo these trials and tribulations successfully. As they are undertaking these trials and tribulations, they're becoming purer and purer. This is what it means to be a Sanfi. The Asfiyo, that's the plural of Sanfi. And we want to discuss who the Asfiyo are and what their repentance entails. Although difficulties, they vary from person to person, but by means of these burdens, one grows, elevates, and purifies oneself and distances oneself gradually more and more from those impurities. And this is the effect of burdens. This is the role of burdens in this world. Once someone came to Imam Sadr asking him to pray that he never undergoes any burdens. Then Imam Sadr answered, you've wished for your death because as a person, a living person is living, they have to inevitably undergo burdens. You can't escape it. The secret though is how one undertakes and forbears these burdens. The refined, the purified, the sophi, the osio, the asfio, they, they manage to succeed in managing these trials and tribulations. After all, a living person can't live without difficulty. As the verse in the Holy Quran says, لَقَدْ خَلَقَنَا لَإِنسَانَا فِي كَبَدْ Very, we've created man in difficulty. It's part of who we are to undergo these difficulties. Internally, but 
they don't express anything externally. On the outside they're happy, but on the inside they're still, it's problematic for them. They're complaining on the inside. But on the outside they're patient. A third group of people, they neither complain nor are they distraught. Both externally and internally, yes, they're, they're happy. They have no problem with the burdens. They regard burdens as a blessing. They regard encountering these burdens as a blessing. And it's happened to them, and they see it as a blessing. And finally, there are some people whose will is totally annihilated in Allah's will. They have no self will or desire. And their motto is, if Allah desires it, I desire it. They're not even happy or sad when events happen. It all depends upon Allah's will. I want that which Allah wants. That's the motto. Okay. Now, with the Asriyah, here, these people, they view burdens as an opportunity. So that they belong to the third class, if you like. They view these burdens that they encounter as an opportunity. They don't want to escape from it. They don't want to flee away from it. They don't hate it either. When they encounter these burdens, they don't hate it. This is a high degree of Iman. It takes time until one reaches this stage. Now, for these people who see burdens as an opportunity, as an opportunity to remove spiritual impurities from themselves, and become more and more refined. With these people, the Asfiya, if a burden was to arise and they become disappointed, or if a burden was to arise and then the burden becomes eliminated and they become happy, in either of these two scenarios, the Asfiya regard this as a transgression. It's a sin for them. It's not a Sharia sin. But for them it's a sin. And this is what they have to repent for. Because they're going against what it means to be one of the Asfiya. A burden comes, they become disappointed. They repent. Why did I become disappointed? This is fear coming my way. This is an opportunity for me. Why did I become disappointed? Or if a burden comes and then the burden goes away, becomes eliminated, they become happy. It's a sin. Not a Sharia sin, don't get me wrong. Why should they be happy? It's meant the end of their fear when the burden goes away. Some of the old Allah, when the when the burden leaves them, they start crying. It's very difficult for them because they know as the burden goes, fear is leaving. That's the level of evil they have. For this group of people, yes, Malam Yatu Faulaika Minat Dalami. Whoever doesn't repent, they want the Dalami. For these people, not repenting is, is if they don't repent from when they become disappointed on encountering burdens. When they become happy when burdens go. When they become happy when burdens if they repent. If they don't repent, they are darling. But not darling in the Sharia sense. But they are darling. And they say that I want to have seen. So here, such a stance from such people when they become happy, 
when their burdens go or when they become disappointed when the burdens come, distance they see as a transgression and it needs Tawbe. Why does it need Tawbe? Because someone says to the Safi, someone tells them, you have to be embarrassed by getting sad or becoming happy because this burden is purifying you. Be embarrassed that you became sad when you encountered the burden. You are of the Asfiya. Why did you become sad? Be embarrassed. You know that this burden is a tawfiq. At least you know those below, the awam and the khawas that we spoke in the previous nights, okay, we don't expect from them. But you know. Be embarrassed by becoming disappointed when these burdens came your way. Be embarrassed when you became happy when the burdens went. Why should you be happy? Your tawfiq has come to an end. Why are you happy? Repent. Isn't it ugly for such people after having this relief from burdens? Isn't it ugly for such people, from the asfiyah, to say, I am now comfortable they make a sigh of relief. Yes, for me and you, that's okay. For these people though, Iman, the higher it goes, the more difficult things become. It's ugly for such people to say, oh, all right, I'm comfortable now, I'm at peace now. I've got, got rid of that burden. I'm in peace with myself. The burden's gone. Now, just to give a few examples, but you have to forgive me, I'm not very good with examples. And many people have told me this. As long as you've understood the general principle, that's good. Then you may not agree with my example, that's okay. For example, guests come to someone's house and they turn out to be very bad guests. They keep on backbiting and doing various things. And it's very difficult for you to tolerate. Some people keep on groaning. They groan to their spouse. What kind of guests are these? Let them grow the quicker they go, the better. And they keep on complaining. But the asfio, no. They see this, they are encountering a burden. And they see this as to fear. And with this burden, they are purifying themselves. You see, the take on life differs. Well, for example, someone marries. They do their research, and then they marry. The man or the woman, your spouse, turns out to be a very bad spouse. Divorce isn't the solution. Divorce is the last result. It should rarely happen. If you think of divorce as a first or second course of action, no. You did your research, now the sister or the brother has turned out bad. You have to encounter this burden, this difficulty with patience. See this as a fear. Many prophets had bad spouses. They had patience before. They kept on increasing their tawfiq through them. Don't get angry, don't complain. Be patient with that spouse. Grow through this spouse. For 50, 60, 70, 80 years of your life, you're going to live with him or her. Use this burden as purifying yourself. This is, this is important. Don't look for shortcuts or to be at rest, at peace. And then you get rid of the burden. Oh, it's much better now. Life is better. No. Tall feet has been cut from you. You may have a pseudo happiness, but tall feet has been cut. Or for example, some people 
before. I was in England. It was quite a lot of this. Why did they go to the Jose? Why would they go to the secondary schools? It was a quick way out. They had difficulties, for example, in the West. This was a quick way out. And then they go to the seminaries. They're escaping the burdens of where they were living. These people, when they go to Rome or when they go to Najaf, they have to be very careful. They have to make sure that their studies in Rome and Najaf, it's so much and it's so they study with so much gravity and seriousness that they undergo burdens of that time. If they want to go to a ball and they don't study, there's no seriousness. After five or six years of basic knowledge, they want to come back to America or England where university students are already are very knowledgeable, they know the basics, they're wasting their time. They have to put that burden upon themselves. It shouldn't be an escape route that I was there. And you can think of many other examples yourselves. But the Asfiyar know. They grow through their burdens. So one must be grateful for such elevation causing events and incidents that occur for one. Through burdens, one benefits, one acquires virtue, one becomes purified through them. In one tradition from Amir al-Mu'minin alayhi salam, he says the rate at which our Shia, unfortunately I couldn't find the Arabic, but I have seen the tradition before. The translation was the rate at which our Shia encounter burdens is tantamount to the rate of water coming down a steep hill. Part of the identity of the Shia is encountering these burdens. The Shia they don't look for quick way out. Although one has to use these burdens in the right way, fail when encountering these burdens. Okay. So, Tawbatul Asfiyah Min Al-Tanafus, the repentance of the refined, it's repenting from that being at ease, that relief from burdens. Why? Why should they repent? Because Tawfiyah has come to an end. If they become at ease, and for that they have to repent, they want to keep growing closer to Allah. If the Asfiyah's problems are solved, they pay no attention to it. If their burdens become solved, so be it. And if they they don't feel relieved the true Asfiyah. They come to burdens, they do their duty. The burdens, if they go, they don't become happy. If they remain, they do their duty. They don't become disappointed. If they become happy or disappointed in either scenario, it's a transgression and they sin. They've contaminated themselves. Why? <coughs> because they became happy with the elimination of difficulties. They became happy with being at ease. Being at ease means putting oneself in the domain of dependency, in the domain of captivity. One has to be careful. In America, it's very easy to have that feeling. That makes it more difficult to grow. The Avon 
the Hamas, the, the preceding classes of Iman that we discussed during the previous times, they think that the Asfiya become happy. And that's what we can expect from them, because that's all they know. They think the Asfiya become happy when burdens go. But they don't understand who the Asfiya are. When Imam Khomeini traveled from Paris to Iran, during the journey, there was a news reporter, an American news reporter, from ABC, I don't know. And the reporter asked Imam Khomeini, after all these struggles, after all these burdens, you've succeeded, the burdens have gone, the difficulties have gone, how do you feel? This is a very delicate point. Imam replied in one word, mono He replied, each, which means nothing. The Iranian brother who was translating, he mistranslated that and said to the American news reporter, the translator said, no comment. That, that, that's wrong. Imam had a comment, he made a comment. He said, each. The news reporter said, all these burdens have gone, you've succeeded, you've come to Iran now. How do you feel? He said, nothing, each. The translator said, no comment. So that news reporter got the wrong idea altogether. Even in Iran, many people didn't understand what Imam wanted to say. Because people are Iran, they're the common people. That Imam isn't strong. Some people criticized Iran. He said, why did you say nothing? This is your country, you have to be happy. All these burdens have gone, you have to be happy now. You're coming back to your country. No? Iran was one of the Asfiya. The burdens went, but he didn't become happy. No. When the burdens come, he doesn't become sad. He acts according to his duty. This is important. And this is what we have to learn. Okay. The next class, Tawbatul Awliya. Min Talawwathil Khatil. Talawwathil Khatil. Here now is the Tawbe of the Wali. The Wali now. What does this mean? When does a wali repent? As we said, whoever you are, be you a simple woman, be you a wali, be you a prophet, you have to do tawbah. Malam yato, if you don't, you are not the dalimim. What, what, what does the wali, the wali your Allah, the saint of Allah, the disciple of Allah, the lover of Allah, what do these people repent from? Being tainted by destruction. What does this mean? What does this mean? Here we have to know what a wali is. Like before, we had to see who the asfiya are, what the definition of the safi is, before we understand what repentance entails. Here we have to understand what, what's the essence of being a wali of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once we understand that, we'll understand what their repentance entails. Literally, wenaya is when two things are so close with one another that it's as if there's an absence of distance between them. And that's why in Wudu, one of the prerequisites is Mawalad. It comes from Walaya, the same root. Because you have to do the steps and components of the Wudu, one after the other, without leaving any gaps in between. When there's an absence of distance between two things, that's a literal 
definition. I think it's much deeper than that. I don't need to go into literal definitions right now. So even when you cement two bricks, there's a wedding in between them because you know, they're cemented together. The wali of Allah, the wali of Allah, they have a physical dimension in the physical world and they have a spiritual dimension in the celestial domain. In both domains they have wadaya. The wali in the celestial domain, they are annihilated, fana firdah. Annihilated in Allah. And that's what closeness to Allah means. They become so close to Allah, it's as if there's no distance between them. They're annihilated now in Allah. Like a piece of charcoal that is burned in fire, there's no distance between the charcoal and fire. These people now become annihilated in Allah, subhanAllah. There's no distance between them. That's why they call them Wali of Allah. Because of that proximity with Allah. They are in communion with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All impediments for them, all impediments to Allah are eliminated. They are with awareness, with irfan, they are in unity with Allah in the presence of Allah and they're not distracted by other than Allah because of that close proximity with Allah and that's why they're called Wali. In the physical world, these people, because of their authority and responsibility, it's as if they're closely intertwined with society too. They have to be with the people. They have to mix with the people. They're not distanced from the people. There's an absence of distance between them and the people. They live together. The wali is always amongst the people. And here too, that's why they call them wali here. So they are wali, be it in the physical realm or in the celestial realm. Now, with such a person, if they acquire awareness, if they become distracted from that being in the presence of Allah, and they become distracted to worldly matters, non-celestial matters, non ghaibi matters, for them, this is a mighty transgression. For them, it's a sin. And for them, they will repent. They'll repent. Tawbatul awliya min talawwathil khatir. They become tainted with destruction. They are in the presence of Allah, they are wali. But also being wali, they are also required to be with the people, do things with the people. Whenever they, that focus, that presence of Allah, momentarily even, is distracted by speaking with someone, doing certain things, they are immensely embarrassed. They can't take it. It's very difficult for them. This is a high degree of Iman. And if they don't repent, they are one of the Dalimin. The Dalimin, not in the Sharia sense. Not in the previous senses. This dharma mean is very, very delicate. We don't even understand what it means when they say you are la ilaha illa and inni kuntum in mean. We don't even understand what they mean. And they become distracted for whatever reason. Momentarily, they're always recalling Allah. But when they're distracted from the presence of Allah, it's not a rational exercise here. For them it's difficult. It's immensely difficult. I'm going to read the tradition in a minute. They can't take it. And as they attend to, as they focus, as their attention is 
diverted to other than Allah, it's as if a veil is established between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the result of that presence of that veil, a presence of that separation, they see it as a sin. For a moment I became separate from Allah. From the presence, the unity of Allah, I became separated. I had to attend to worldly matters. Even though Allah required him to do these worldly matters, but for them it's difficult. This is their perfection. This is their repentance. This is their attaining salvation. Tubu in Allah Jamia Ayyuhal Mu'minu Lalakum Tuflihu. There's one tradition from Imam Kavim alayhi salam. This is one of those traditions that it's very delicate. But now I've given you the principles, you should understand this easier. Muhammad ibn Sulaiman relates this. He says, Kharajto ma'a abil hasan Musa ibn Ja'far I left with the seventh Imam alayhi salam. We were heading towards some of his land, some of his property. He established the Dhuh prayer, the seventh Imam. As the prayer finished, the Imam fell down before Allah in the Sajda position. regards his speaking as sinning. Because when you even speak, you're diverting your attention away from that presence of Allah. You're speaking. This is the level of Imam. And I've sinned against you, O Allah, with my eyes, with my seeing. And if you want it, what is that it? By your mind, if you want it, you would have 
those definitely make me blind. But what seeing is this that makes him think he's sinning? It's seeing in the physical realm. Seeing things that you have to see. He's required to see. The Sharia asks you to see. But since it's distracting him even momentarily in the presence of Allah, it's difficult for him to come to terms with that. He is a saint okay. I'm sinning against you. Wa asaytuka bisamri. And also, I've sinned against you with my hearing. Walau shaita wa izzati la asmantani. You would most definitively make me deaf if you wanted. Because I've sinned with my ears, O Allah. And if you wanted by your mind, you would have easily made me deaf as a result of what I did. Because he has to listen to what people have to say. He has to listen to people's complaints. He's the imam of the people. He has to do it. It's required of him. But by doing this, he's tainting himself with distractions. Distractions from what? In the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I say to Kabiyadi, I've sinned against you with my hands. And if you wanted, you would most certainly make me lame. What I say to her, Berenshi, I've sinned against you with my feet. When I was shaped, I was a zetic, Lajadam Tani, you would most certainly make me a leper. After what I've done with my feet, what, what has he done with his feet? Wa Sayyiduka Bifaji. I'm even sinned against you. Forgive the expression, but the anointing with my private parts. Okay. Because even when he's in a legitimate relationship, during certain actions, he's diverted to that presence of Allah. It's difficult for them. It's difficult. Well, I wish it was a thing. If you wanted, by your mind, you would most definitively would, would make me infertile. This is what how he takes it. And he's repenting. And he says, What I say to Gabi Jani in Jawari, Alati and Amta Biha Ali. I've sinned against you with all my limbs. All my limbs have sinned against you. These limbs that you've graced me with, you've blessed me with, I've sinned with all of them. This wasn't the recompensation befitting for you, for me. You blessed me, you graced me with all this. It wasn't right for me to sin against you with all these blessings that you gave me, with all these limbs. It wasn't on a par with befitting for me to sin against you always. Thumma ahsaytu. Ahsaytu lahu alfa barra wa awayahu. Then Muhammad ibn Sulaiman said, then I counted him. I was counting and saying a thousand times that Imam was saying after this door he read after Salatul Dhu, a thousand times Al Af, Al Af, Al Af, asking for forgiveness, seeking forgiveness from Allah, a thousand times. Because Muhammad ibn Sulaiman is a lover of Imam Qadhi. It doesn't matter. He will remain and just seeing the Imam for hours and hours, scrutinizing his actions. He wants to learn. A thousand times he said, ah, ah. Maybe a thousand means a lot, I don't know. But still, it was a lot. It may have been a thousand. 
ثم ألسى خطه العينان بالأعلى Then the Imam put his right side of his face on the earth فسمعت وهو يقول Then I heard him saying بصوت حزين again I heard him saying after a thousand times of Af with a very sorrowful voice Bokto ilayk bedanmi I'm coming to you with all my sins of Allah So the Imam here, he will carry out his normal duties which were required of him as an Imam, his duties to the people in society. But these duties were on the par with detaching from Allah, being attentive, albeit momentarily, to worldly matters, meaning the exit from the presence of Allah. That they couldn't tolerate. So they, they would buy things, they would speak to people, they would sell things, they would go to different places, and all these were necessary. But these things by default, they require detachment from alcohol, coming out of that presence. Awareness, focus on creation, on how. And this was their sin. So how can a maxim say all this? Some people think it's education, but they don't mean it really. It's education that they say all this. There may be some education attached to it, but this can't be the case. It's not on the point with those verses of the Quran that everyone has to repent. And if it's just an external, superficial thing, you know, it's not a very good understanding of the Imams. Although I don't deny this some degree of education attached to it, you have to learn from what they have learned. But this is just not a simple expression for us to learn. They don't want to just exist. They really believe they were nothing. 
they really believed they were sinners. Why? Because when being in the presence of our Lord, when you become detached from that presence, it kills you. And that problem is a sin, a mighty sin, a Quranic Kabir. It's a Kabir sin, a major sin. But these Sharia sins are nothing compared to those sins. And various people have given different analogies. I won't go through them. But when the Imams in Dwai Shabani alone, he happily kamala in the I want to be cut from everything towards you. From everything. But no, they have to attend to matters of the heart too. They're married, they have children, they have responsibilities in society. And this by default entails they can't have that any better. It's not possible. And this kills them. They're sinning. For them it's a sin. And they repent. That's their repentance. Men talabwathil khatir. Even the Holy Messenger of Allah, when he says, لا يغان على قلبي فإني لا أستغفر الله في كل يوم سبعين مرة, it's as if, most definitely, upon my heart has become tainted. That every day I say, أستغفر الله, I seek repentance from Allah. I seek forgiveness from Allah 70 times a day. In some traditions, after being in every assembly of people, he says, Astaghfirullah. Not that he's done anything wrong. It's just when he's with the people, he has to attend to their matters. It's difficult. Even here. What's difficult? Being cut away from Allah, the presence of Allah, being in unity with awareness being cut from that even for a moment, it kills them. And then the final task is Tawbatul Anbiya, the repentance of the Prophets. Men terabis sin. From terabis sin. And what does that mean? Inshallah tomorrow, we'll touch upon that. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.